I understand this concept of microsatellite instability it can be pretty tricky to get. It's sort of like me trying to write a valentine for the medical students. Uh, I got off on the wrong foot here, uh, but Dr. Topham was able to straighten me out, and I think I've got it now. So let's see if we can figure out microsatellite instability the same way. The first thing we have to do to understand microsatellite instability is to figure out what a microsatellite is in the first place. The important bit is that we've got lots of repeats of the same thing over and over again, and of course they're anti-parallel complements repeated over and over again. We always draw them uh, as uh, repeats of three nucleotides, but that's not important. That They can be repeats of other sequences. We could just have A's and T's repeated over and over again. We could have two nucleotides, three or four. The important point is that we have lots of repeats of the same thing and of course repeats of their anti-parallel complements on the other strand. So if we take those two strands apart they no longer have that rigidity that we see in double-stranded DNA. They are single-strand nucleic acids. They can form hairpins. They can flop around. They aren't constrained the way double-stranded nucleic acids are. So I showed one popping out here and one popping out here, but really they'll just both be flopping around in the breeze. Now if we try to put those two molecules back together, here's where the repeat part comes in to be important. Because any given repeat can find any other anti-parallel complement and anneal to it. And these guys all think that this is fine. They have found their anti-parallel complement. The fact that they've come back together out of register doesn't occur to them because everything looks like it's complementary. Uh, it, it, the fact that a couple of these guys don't find a partner, little game of musical chairs, they got left out when the music stopped. This doesn't change the overall stability of the duplex very much, so this isn't really noticed. And the important part about microsatellite instability is that microsatellites have many repeats of the same sequence, all next to each other. If we take the two strands apart, it's very difficult to get them to come back into alignment in phase, and we're likely to miss that phase and think that we've got everything okay because everybody is base paired accurately in the places that we see it, but some things aren't base paired at all. So now let's imagine this going on in the context of a DNA replication fork. So I'm going to ignore the guy at the top. We're just going to follow one strand. So here's the bottom strand with the blue arrows, and we're putting green arrows in. So here's the DNA polymerase coming along, adding green arrows as it goes. So it's a synthesizing DNA 5 prime to 3 prime like it always does. While it's doing that, one of those template molecules, one of the repeats on the template strand down here, uh, does the thing that single-stranded DNA will do when it isn't paired with a duplex, is it becomes floppy and it waves around and it pops out. So as the DNA polymerase comes along, it's not going to notice that, and that seems surprising but there really is a lot of flexibility in the template molecule and we can get those bases to sit just exactly the right position even though we've got this guy popped out. So the DNA polymerase comes along, puts a green arrow, puts a green arrow, puts a green arrow, and it just keeps synthesizing. What it doesn't notice is that when it gets to the end and starts back into unique sequences over here, it doesn't notice that it's made one fewer green arrow uh, than it would normally because of this guy was popped out and he didn't even notice him. At this point, the mismatch repair machinery is supposed to come along and say, wait a second, that's not right. We've got a whole piece of this uh, uh, region of the chromosome that we were copying that didn't get copied. If the mismatch repair can, uh, machinery can catch that in time, it can tell the polymerase or some other exonuclease to chew out all the new stuff it just made and try again. But if the mismatch re repair machinery isn't there, then of course this is not going to happen. We're going to have two strands that have different numbers of copies of that repeat. And if we take them apart to copy them in the next cell cycle, we're going to have this guy on the top that has 15 repeats uh, of the green. Oh, that's a terrible five. 15 repeats uh, and 16 repeats uh, down here on the bottom. 
So we have different numbers of repeats in the two strands. The mismatch repair machinery didn't come along and figure this out. And now we go to copy this again, and we uh, make uh, two new duplex molecules, one of them having 15 repeats and one having 16 repeats. So here we've lost a repeat in this molecule uh, because we, uh, we didn't notice that one of the template strands was popped out. It's a little harder to imagine the same sort of thing happening on, on the newly synthesized strand, but it can happen. So if this whole part, uh, if the polymerase pauses, if that comes off of there uh, and makes a single-stranded DNA, when we bring it back, we can get these guys to anneal, again, out of frame, out of phase, uh, and we will have one of the, the, uh, the newly synthesized repeats popped out, and now when we go on to copy it, the DNA polymerase thinks everything's okay because everything looks annealed behind it. So it just goes on and copies the rest of it. Uh, and what we end up with is, uh, instead of missing a repeat, we end up with 17 repeats on the top uh, and 16 on the bottom, like we were supposed to have. Again, if the mismatch repair machinery doesn't catch that and tell this guy to fix it, uh, then what's going to happen is in the next cycle we're going to separate those two strands. We're not going to be able to tell that there's a problem anymore once they're separated, and we're going to end up making one molecule with 17 and one with 16. So here we've added a repeat. Uh, so we end up with an extra copy of the repeat. So this is why these guys are so difficult to copy, is because we can't tell when we've got them in register and out of register. Uh, and the polymerase has a hard time telling whether or not it's made the right number of copies. So we can either lose or gain copies when we replicate these guys. Without mismatch repair machinery, that's a much more common problem. It doesn't get fixed because it doesn't get recognized. And we have uh, changes in the copy number of these sequences. Now, I've shown it happening at one locus, but of course there are thousands of these uh, unstable regions all over the genome that usually are kept in check by the mismatch repair machinery. But if it isn't there, uh, then we're going to have massive genetic instability as thousands of regions lose and gain copies all over the genome. That's what microsatellite instability is and why it's associated with mismatch repair defects and why we can use uh, PCR to diagnose such a thing because we look at these regions and we find different copy numbers even within tissues and from the same person uh, indicating that mismatch repair has failed in some of those tissues.